We're live. Hello, everybody. Hey. Uh, so for anybody who stumbles upon this or goes back in time to check it out, uh, this is the beta episode zero of our new show, Get It Made, where we talk about some stuff that we're going to talk about. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, is, it, this is going to be a totally stripped down, we don't have any of our materials yet episodes, so we're not going to have any music, we're not going to have any bumpers, not going to have any visuals, we're going to have cats running around in the background. But uh, it goes. <laughs> yeah, in the future, we hope to add uh, production value. That would be really nice. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to episode zero of Get It Made. Uh, my name is Mike Lipson. I'm Ben Marshalkowski. And we're going to talk a little bit about productivity, creativity, uh, how to do stuff, how to make stuff, and how we do and make stuff, uh, and what kind of stuff we're making. So uh, let's start by talking, just because this is kind of the introductory episode, we'll give you a little bit of a sense of who it is you're listening to, and then we'll jump right into some articles and news and stuff. Um, so like I said, my name is Mike Lipson. Uh, I'm a teacher, I'm a gamer, and I'm kind of a newbie developer. So I... Uh, most of my productivity-related work is around making um, either games or uh, other kind of application projects. Uh, sorry, my cat's very distracting. Um, so I'm, you know, futzing around with programming. I'm futzing around with any kind of digital application or creativity tool I can mess around with, and I just love playing with that kind of stuff. And um, I am a uh, writer. I write a blog, which is currently in the process of being transferred between um, hosting, so you can't see it right now. <laughs> but um, I do write a blog, and then I am also a board game designer, and I am learning to code. I'm at a very basic level right now, but um, in all those kind of things, it's really, you know, yeah, about workflow and process and figuring out what's the quickest way I can do stuff, what's the quickest way I can go from idea to prototype. And... Um, make myself as efficient as possible. Awesome. And the uh, the name of your blog is? Uh, BoardGameBen.com. If you go there right now, I think you can see the home page, but then when you try to get anywhere, it's just going to fall apart on you. But that uh -huh. should hopefully be back in like a day or two. Cool. All right, well, by the time anybody sees this, with any luck, they'll be able to look at it. Back in action, yeah. All right, so we're going to jump right into the... Uh, New, I'm using air quotes right now, but the news uh, is a weekly show, so it's not so new. But uh, we'll talk about the news of the week, or maybe even just some articles that we find that we think are interesting. Uh, this week Oliver is going to be a little it. bit more of the latter. What's that? If John Oliver does it, we can too. Yeah, right? We can. Let's just, let's just go for it. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is an article I found. Uh, well, it's not much of an article. It's more of an infographic. And uh, we could talk forever about infographics, but there's this infographic called The Daily Routines of Famous Creative People, and Lifehacker was uh, posting it this week, but it's kind of made the rounds on the web. Have you had a chance to check it out? I have not. I will pull it up now, though. Yeah, the, the link I put in the notes goes to Lifehacker, but from there you can get a link to the actual thing. And on Lifehacker you can see an image that shows you kind of the, the visual diagram, but uh, if you actually go to the site, there's, there's hover over you know, little balloons you can see with that oh, give you wow. a lot more information. But basically the idea here is that it's a bar graph, kind of, uh, where each person on the list, and this is, you know, famous creative people, uh, Beethoven, Maya Angelou, Kurt Vonnegut, Ben Franklin, uh, Sigmund Freud are on here. Uh, and it basically kind of shows their routine and what they spent different parts of their day on, how much time they spent on each thing. Uh, and if you mouse over, you can get a little bit more kind of specific information about what it was they were doing. But uh, it's a really cool way to both compare what different people kind of thought was a priority and also to get kind of wider uh, uh, conclusions about how people spent their time. So, for example, the first thing I look at when I see this is sleep, which is the, uh, like the kind of um, turquoise-ish color here. Mm -hmm. And you can, at a glance, see like when people slept, and it's like really, it's really easy to tell, you know, who went to bed early, who went to bed late. Um, but with all of them, you can see that they slept a pretty fair amount. Um, so sure. if you're looking to emulate creative people, then you probably want to be getting your sleep. Um, but there's other things in here too that are really interesting: how much time people spend on creative work, how much time they spend at their day jobs. 
Uh, how much time they spend exercising is really interesting. You know, not everybody on here exercises, but most of them did. Uh, some of them multiple times per day. So mm -hmm. just interesting insights you can get from this about how people uh, chose to structure their time. Yeah, that's really that's really cool. Actually, seeing um, I like that Balzac woke up at one a.m. and started working. Apparently, yeah. Just goes to show you that you do not have to be on a normal schedule. You just have to be on a schedule. Well, as a person living on the West Coast and working on an East Coast timeline, um, I can appreciate that. So yeah, that's pretty. For you. Is your uh, like, way, sleep? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to ask you, is your sleep schedule all weird because of that? Are you all jacked up? Well, a little bit. Not that crazy, though, because I'm up at 6, and I'm just, like, right into work rather than, like, kind of getting ready and stuff. So yeah. it's it's like a shift, but it's not, like, my sleep is pretty much the same time it was normally. Maybe oh, okay. I'm up an hour earlier. That's not too but, bad. Yeah. So I, would, I don't know I would, about you, but I was out there last summer. As, well, you know. I was out there last summer, and I have never felt like I actually adjusted. I just kind of enjoyed the fact that it felt like I was going to bed late and waking up late, and I never quite lost that feeling. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of that. Kind of nice. Um, <laughs> I enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, it works. Uh, by the way, when I'm looking down like at the bottom of the screen, that is because I'm looking at my iPad, which has all the show notes. So um, mm -hmm. that, if that's confusing to anyone, that's what I'm doing. Cool. Uh, maybe later in the show, if we get a chance, I think somewhere in here we said we were going to talk a little bit about Oh, and no, I didn't make it in here. But maybe at some point we could talk about our setups and what devices we use, and et cetera, et cetera. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that could fill up a whole show, I'm sure. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Uh, let's jump on to this next article. All right, so this is one I found, which really excited me at first, which was called this new app site, which is supposed to streamline like reading and bookmarking of websites. And so basically what it talks about is these people launched this, this app, and what you can do is basically it takes an image of a website and then bookmarks it for you, like figures out what the URL is from the image of it, and books mar bookmarks that for you within the app. Which at first I thought was really cool because I thought you were going to be able to just like be on your computer and like snap a photo of your screen and get it. But what it is is only when you're actually on your phone, you have to take a screenshot of it, and then that automatically gets grabbed by site and it will process it, and if it's a website, it'll find the URL from there. So it's a cool idea of being able to take an image and figure out the URL from it, but it's not fully baked yet. It doesn't send that bookmark anywhere useful at this point other than the site. It doesn't, and it doesn't, like like I say, you can't be, like, looking at your work screen and taking a picture with your phone and get that same process yet. Hopefully they'll eventually do something like that with it because it, I like the visual to data idea, but like I say, I don't feel like it's quite there yet. Yeah, I mean, I I can't picture how this would help me. You know, like I I'm really interested in the technology and I love that image recognition is getting to the point where it's useful. But what I mean, isn't this a longer, more? Aren't there more steps involved in this process than just? Bookmarking the site. Well, it's, Don't get it's me wrong. From a from a strictly initializing standpoint, it's actually very quick because you can do something like that. Here, I'll even use my video abilities and show you that. Like, I've got the website up. I can just snap a picture of it with my phone, and it's already going to be taken by site right now. So that's actually so it watches your camera roll. Then it's as, yeah, it watches your camera roll. Okay. And so it's as quick as that. And now if I go to the the app. You can see, well, maybe you can't see, but it's analyzing up there, and then once it gets yeah. done, it'll populate up there, which I think I've already done for this. Yeah, it's already up there on that website. But now it's in here, so this isn't my browser. I'm not going to go here just to look at these bookmarks. Right. If it eventually well, comes to Evernote or Pocket or something, that would be cool. Yeah, I'm sure all that integration will come later. But yeah, I mean, yeah. if you go there and you tap the image, doesn't it just take you back to the browser? Pretty much, yeah. Well, I think there's a there is a browser in it, but it's yeah. not the one I'm going to use. Right. Well, that's the other thing is like because of the. I mean, we could talk about restrictions on iOS, but because of the restrictions on iOS, you can't use other browsers effectively unless every app you use integrates them. And really, Chrome is the only browser that does that. So you're using a subpar in-app browser that's not as good as mm -hmm. your main browser. And yeah, this is a multitude of problems. I mean, iOS. Issues aside, can we agree that bookmarking needs work? 
Oh, the, yeah. The process of bookmarking sucks. And I keep seeing um, I keep seeing references on sites like Lifehacker that talk about Google's Stars project. Mm-hmm. Uh, this isn't in the show notes, but whatever, we can talk about it. Um, and it's this project that's supposedly going to make bookmarking a lot better. And man, I'm ready. Like, make it better, because I'm not happy with the... The closest setup. thing do I have to a good one right now is the Evernote plugin to Chrome. Yeah. It makes it pretty easy to do, and it 90% of the time knows which notebook I want to put the particular thing in. But then from there, yeah. they just sit in there. Like, right, I'm and not, it's mixed in with all my other stuff. Like, I could... Uh, I could make a notebook for bookmarks, but that's no different than just having bookmarks in the browser. And if I mix it in with all my other stuff, then I gotta go find everything. And like I, I know that the whole point of Evernote is supposed to be that you can easily find what you're looking for, but not always that way for me. I mean, sometimes I'll search four or five times before I can find what I'm looking for, and it's just, it just doesn't always work as expected. And even when it does work, it's pretty slow. I, I shouldn't talk about. It. I still use it. I use it for everything. Oh, I do, too. Like, whenever I see something interesting that I just don't have time to read if I'm at work or if I'm doing something, I just, yeah. So you use it as, like, a read-it-later kind of thing? Yeah. See, I use Pocket for Which that. is a whole nother Yeah, oh, we'll do a whole day on that, definitely. But, yeah, uh, yeah I use Pocket for read-it-later. And Pocket is actually, it's closer to, like, a DVR for me. I use it for a lot of video. I'll sit down oh, okay. and have, like, a Pocket video mm-hmm. watching marathon. I might even do that tonight. Cool. Um, anyway, since we've strayed from the topic at hand, let's move on to the next thing. Yes. Um, so, next thing I want to talk about is super general, but I want to talk about it anyway, because I think it's cool. Um, so, specifically, one of the things we want to do on this show as kind of a weekly, regular segment is um, put the spotlight on community projects or open source projects or things that you can contribute to if you're looking for something to work on. Because one of the problems that we have in the world of, you know, creativity is not just how do you do the thing you want to do, but what do I do, right? Like, oh, I have this time. I want to be productive. What do I do in that time? And so we're going to try to offer some options depending on, you know, what it is you're interested in and how you want to spend your time, what kind of tasks you like to do, and uh, we'll see if we can find something cool for everybody. Mm-hmm. But uh, so the first thing I want to talk about this week is GitHub. So uh, for those who are not programmers, you may not be familiar with GitHub, but GitHub is a utility, but it's also a social network. It's kind of a uh, congregating place for programmers, anybody who does work with uh, computer programming. And it provides a lot of tools that let people um, store the things that they make on it and share things and collaborate and work together on stuff. But it's also just a great place to find projects that you can work on or that are looking for people to, to contribute to them. And it's kind of a, a collaborative work environment for programmers. Mm-hmm. So I love it because you can find all kinds of awesome stuff. I mean, I've uh, like if I need a website template, I'll go there and search, and often I'll find it. If I need um, you know, a, a library, like I was making a, uh, a web application that was going to talk to Twitter, and I needed people to be able to sign in, and Twitter uses OAuth, which is pretty complex, and I'm a total nub, and I don't know how to use it. So I went on to GitHub, and I searched for OAuth libraries, and I found an OAuth library that I could just add to my project, and then I was able to get my user logged in with only a few lines of code. Um, nice. So there's a, it's really good for stuff like that, but there's, I mean, everything is on there. You can go, actually, if you get a chance, go to the, the Explore button up at the top. If I go ahead and click Explore, uh, I mean, there's just all these different categories, 3D modeling, web games, data visualization, package managers, web application frameworks. Uh, there's a whole music category. The, the cool thing about this is people use it for stuff that's not normal code stuff. Like, I actually have one of my uh, game design courses posted up here, all the documentation for the course. So oh, if wow. anybody wants to offer my advanced game design course, they can go grab all the documentation and offer it, or they can contribute to it if they want to. That's really cool. Now, do they also, like, do, like, support, like, if you're, like, trying to figure something out with your code? Like, I know, like, I see a lot of Stack Overflow and stuff, does stuff like that. Does GitHub as well? Uh, yeah, so if you're working on a project that, you know, has multiple contributors and you run into an issue, you can post issues in their kind of issues section for the project, 
And okay. it actually works a lot like a ticket system, if you've ever if you're familiar with that in like the world mm-hmm. of IT. Um, yep. So I'll, I'll go to an example. So there's an app that I use a lot, although I've fallen off lately, called Habit RPG. Mm-hmm. Right now here, but the, the project for Habit RPG is up here. So you can go and read through all the code and look at everything that they have in there. Uh, but you can also go and click issues. Here it is. And there are 621 issues right now and 3,000 closed issues. So basically, each one gets a number, and I can click on it and see. I'm doing that right now. I can click on it and see like what somebody's concern was, and then there's a, a space down at the bottom where you can have a discussion about it. There's kind of a comment system there. And, uh, and the issue can be closed once it's fixed. So if you're contributing, one of the ways you can contribute to a project is not just to write your own code, but to go in, find bugs, and report them. And that helps the people who do write the code go in and and fix them. Yeah, that's really cool. I think it's awesome. Uh, None of my projects, as you might imagine, are are well-known enough to get anybody (laughs) submitting issues. But um, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm considering, you know, if I ever run into a problem with HabitRPG or any of the other apps that I use that are hosted on GitHub, I might go in and just kind of uh, um, report some of that stuff. Just because, you know, even by reporting a bug, you're contributing. Yeah. Very true. Um, this is cool. There's all kinds of, you know, you can label them, so there's kind of like a tagging system, so you can work on a bunch of related bugs at the same time. There's sorting. It's, it's just it's actually, like, it's a really interesting platform even if you're not doing app development. Like, you, you can use it for a lot of different things. Very cool. cool. So, so actually... you were going to tell us about Board Game Hour? Yeah, I'm actually going going to go completely off notes here because I realized that what I was had noted here isn't really on that subject. Okay. Um, but I can talk about um, BoardGameGeek.com, which is a very popular gaming website for board gamers. And um, kind of in the same vein of like if you're looking for something to do or looking for a project to work on but you want to do a game design, particularly tabletop game design, what BoardGameGeek does is every month they do a... Basically, you have a month to create a game, and they'll give you a prompt. It's almost like an Iron Chef type of thing where they'll give you maybe some mechanics you have to use or a limitation, like you can only use 20 components in the entire game, stuff like that. And basically from there, everyone over the course of a month will design, play, test, and submit their games, and they choose a winner every month, and they get some gold, geek gold, which is their currency on the site, as well as maybe a free game or something. But it's a really cool idea that if you're just like, you know, you want to you wanna create a game, but you don't know what to do, it's a great jumping off point. Because one of the biggest problems designers have in any field is that if you have all the options open to you, you don't know where to start. But getting like one or two of those restrictions in there really gives you that opportunity to say, okay, I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to make this really good because this is what I have to work on. So it can be a really good system. And I'm sure there's things like that for coding as well and other things where it's, you know, um, I think it's Harvard has the hackathon. Yeah, hackathons are becoming more and more common, actually. You're seeing them all over the place. Um, and that's something, speaking of, like, productive, productivity things to do, I actually, one of the things I really want to do is participate in a hackathon. I think that'd be really yeah. awesome. But it seems um, to be that general idea that, like, you're given some sort of prompt or something you have to do, and therefore you're kind of given that first step to get going on a project. That's cool. I really like that. We could spend a lot more time talking about the value of constraints. Mm-hmm. Um, I have definitely felt that uh, that whole, you know, I don't know what to do, the options are unlimited thing. Like, it makes mm-hmm. it really, really hard to uh, to decide. Like, when you sit down at a, a blank piece of paper and you don't know what to draw, if there's no guidance, you might sit there for hours trying to figure out what you're going to draw. Mm-hmm. Whereas, if someone tells you to draw a dog, then usually you can figure out you know, at least where you're going to start. And from there, you're able to develop a dog and kind of make it into something that is uniquely your own. And I think that's true of any project. You know, if, if you if you put constraints on it and you focus, then it makes it a lot easier to figure out where you're going. If you don't know where to start, then it's hard to know where you're going. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Cool. So the, the Geek Gold, does that let you actually buy, like, board games? Um... Sort of. It's not really that value. It got devalued pretty quickly, like every internet currency. But um, you can buy like badges on the thing on the site, or sometimes people will. Um, there is a marketplace there too, so you could, in theory, trade some of your geek gold for maybe part of a game, if you wanted to. That's cool. But um, it's just really more of a 
sign of cache. It's like Reddit karma. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. That's Currencies are really hard to do, man. I tried to do uh, currencies in my class once, and it's, oh. man, offering rewards is really tough. Like, mm-hmm. it, like, you have to know... You have to be able to place a value on things that don't have explicit value, you know? Yep. And, and it doesn't work unless there are multiple things with multiple values, and each has value relative to the other, and... Damn, that's really hard. For me in the classroom, it was really hard because I didn't know, like, what can I offer these kids, you know? Like, oh, yeah. you, can, you can control the music for a day or you can have some candy or you can have a five-minute break or something. But it's like, it's, it never works be- because it becomes like a discipline tool and it's not meant to be a discipline tool. It's meant to be mm-hmm. something else. I don't know. It's, it just never, never stuck for me. Well, I, I think have- you always... I think they're always unwieldy. You could even look at like what happened with Diablo 3 where they, you know, yeah. set up the auction system and they, you know, intended for it to work and then it just got hyperinflated because too much stuff was getting into the market. Yeah, that's a there's oh my god, there's so many more issues with that too because it was basically game breaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it, it it took the whole point of the game, which was to gather gear, and mm-hmm. it turned it made it so easy that the game itself was pointless, and it made it doable via real money and not just in-game money, so the game was even more pointless, because you could just buy the game, buy gear, and you're done. You don't need to play the game anymore. Mm-hmm. Which is like, I'm not sure how that one got past them, but yeah. they very smartly decided to remove the auction house, and the game has never been better. It is fantastic. Oh, in I fact, believe I that. might even play it tonight. Oh, so good. That game's like crack, man. It's so good. <laughs> um, affect productivity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not great when you're thinking about productivity. Um, so let's talk about... Our, let's move on to our next segment, which would be a time for some music and maybe a graphic. Oh. But, uh, so the next thing we're going to do is uh, talk about tools and tips. And this is, I think, the meat of where people want to go if they're, if they're tuning in here seeking productivity tips. This is where it really gets interesting. So um, I always go first. You go ahead and go first. All right. So um, I'm going to talk about one that a lot of people probably know about or at least familiar with, which is Google Drive. Um, If you still think it's called Google Docs, check it out now because they've made a lot of updates since then. Um, You have added something. Whoa, you have a a thing now. Sorry, I have a lower third, which I thought I had before, but that was in the other Hangout. I'm going to have to get me one of those for next episode. Uh, yeah, the uh, the app is called Hangout Toolbox, so if you want to play around with that, you can. Good to know. I'll check that out. Uh, um, but anyway, next time. speaking of Google Drive, or, or speaking of Google, Google Drive, um, I find to be incredibly useful. I found it really useful when I was were not working from home and I was working in an office, and um, I would, you know, have an idea, want to write it down, um, work on something at lunch for a game or something, and then when I would get home, I'd want access to it, and carting around a USB stick is just so seven years ago that I was happy to find that Google Drive would let me you know, create all the documents I want. And then over time, I got to really familiar with that and as well um, the spreadsheet tools, which are incredibly useful. Um, because when you're, especially when you're creating a game and you're starting to like build out your components and stuff, um, there's a lot of math that ends up going into that. And, like, for example, I was trying to figure out how, like, certain dice rolls would work, where if you add a die, how does that affect the odds of rolling a success? And I was, like, finding myself writing on Post-it notes, like, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of dice rolls and the results. And then I'm like, there's probably some sort of equation that can do this. And I found online that it's, you know, it's called hypergeometric distribution, which sounds really cool. Um, sure it is. <laughs> and it, but basically just multiplying a bunch of numbers together. Okay. And then I looked on Google Drive, and it's like, oh, yeah, we have a function for that. You just plug in HYPGEO into our spreadsheet thing, and we'll do it for you, and it's wonderful. That's awesome. Um, similarly, just even formatting, like, the version, and I'm, I might be a year back on Excel, but the version of Excel I have lets you conditionally format, I think, three different conditions, where Google Drive is like 
half a dozen at least, if not more conditions. So basically, if I want to make a bunch of different categories and stuff, I can do it really easily with Google Docs and Google Drive and have all that ready so that at a glance I'm like, okay, I know I've got this many of this kind of thing and this many of this kind of thing, and I need to balance this a little better. And it makes it so much quicker to do all that. The, uh, um, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say the, the conditional formatting, it, 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 its appeal isn't immediately obvious until you've used it a little bit, but the, the glanceability of it is like 90% of why I use it, and it's, it's like so valuable to be able to just look and immediately know whether a value is in a certain range or something like that. But exactly. there's also value in the fact that those conditions can change, because you might be making a change in some other area of the spreadsheet, but then that color of that uh, cell changes or the, the highlight of the cell changes and your eye catches it. Yep. And that's actually really valuable because you might not have seen some important piece of information that you've now seen. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's it's really, really valuable to be able to do that. And and you're it sounds like you're even maybe even a little bit deeper than I am into kind of what you can do with formulas. But, uh, but I did a lot with formulas when I was, you know, keeping track of scores and grades. And uh, that's really, really valuable when you're able to just very quickly see, like, okay, how many of my kids are failing? And it highlights, you know, two out of 25. And you're like, okay, yep. that's acceptable. Or it highlights 15 out of 25. And you're like, okay, that's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, exactly the same thing. What I'm so doing. Easy to see. Yeah. Also, to speak to your earlier comment about USB keys, uh, mm -hmm. yes, USB keys are a complete pain. And uh, actually, this one always amazes my students, but at PAX years ago, someone gave me this. It's his business card, and it has oh, a it's one of the USB dongly dude there. Uh, and this thing is a freaking lifesaver because I carry it in my wallet, yep. which means I don't need to carry it on my keychain, which means it doesn't really take up any extra space. Um, that is so nice. I'm loving that. But I rarely use it, honestly. Most of the time I use Dropbox or, or some other syncing service like Google Drive. Yeah. Um, actually, Google Drive has expanded to do all that file syncing stuff, so um, that's a whole other topic. But I will say, uh, of all the things that I love about Google Drive, and I, I don't take advantage of this nearly as much as I should, but it's fairly open and people can integrate with it. And mm -hmm. I especially love some of the things you can do with IFT, I-F-T-T-T. -T -T. Oh, all yeah. these things are topics for other days. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, you can append a line to a document or append a, a row to a spreadsheet so you can just, like, you know, I use, I don't generally use Google Docs as, like, a collection place, but it mm -hmm. sounds like you do, and I could imagine all kinds of ways you could use IFT to keep track of things in Google Drive that you want to be able to keep track of or send things to Google Drive. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I've, um, I don't, I'm not kind of here yet with my technological ubiquity, but someday when I have, like, a, uh, a whole, like, smart home set up and I've got, you know, things turning on and off automatically and logging oh, yeah. when people enter and leave and stuff like that, I could definitely see having all that logged in a Google spreadsheet or a Google uh, document and then just like, oh, I want to see who was here yesterday. So I just pop in there and you can see all that information. It would be really cool. Oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. So that's a, that's a like, few years down the road kind of deal thing yeah. that I have in mind. One, one other small thing that is useful um, when I'm, like, writing a blog is the linking function because it's... It's Google, if you want to make a hyperlink to something in a document, it automatically basically searches whatever you're going to make the link, and it's pretty damn good about figuring out what link you want there, what URL you want to connect it to. So I love that when I'm like, especially when I'm writing like a blog about a board game, and you don't really want to have to go into Board Game Geek and then find the game and then get the link and all that, whereas if you just write the name of the game and you highlight it and say, I want to make a link, it'll generally be like the first or second option there. You just click and you're good to go for that. And then I, from there, I so I'll usually write my blogs, blog posts in Google first and then move it over to WordPress. That's awesome. I actually didn't know about that until we started making the notes for this show. Mm -hmm. And I started, you know, command King to get my, uh, my links in there. And I realized that I was typing in a search field and I was like, wow. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I love that. I've I've only scratched the surface. Oh, and speaking of um, of like what's the word I'm looking for? Focus, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, like constraints. Google Drive is so well focused. Like it's not my text editor of choice. I'm I'm a Apple man, and I love pages and numbers and everything. I'm man, I'm such a numbers freak. 
But uh, <laughs> but Google Docs does such a great job of giving you only what you need. It's so just like only the basics, and you you rarely find yourself needing anything else. They're just so good at determining what it is people are going to use. No, yeah, it's um, it's incredible. There's a couple things I would like to have, just mostly formatting stuff, just because of the way I write. But other than that, like, couldn't ask for anything else from it. Yeah, I, I yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that I've never needed something that wasn't there, but I almost never need something that isn't there. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about a different tool here. My tool of the week is Alfred which is a Mac application. So sorry for those of you who are on Windows. If you are on Windows, uh, I believe the vague thing that I use that's vaguely equivalent is uh, Launchy, I think is what it's called. But um, if anybody is a Mac user and has been around since the days of Quicksilver, you might know what Alfred is, or if you've used Spotlight, which is kind of Apple's built-in equivalent. Uh, or if you saw the, the unveiling of OS X Yosemite, you might have noticed that the new version of Spotlight comes up in the middle of the screen and has like a big search bar. Uh, it's basically kind of a clone of Alfred. Alfred got uh, copied a little bit there. Um, but Alfred is so much more than just a search, and so I, I will try very hard to scratch the surface of what it is. Um, people who might have seen it might have been browsing the iOS App Store or the Mac App I mean, the Mac App Store. Um, it, because it was featured there for a while, it appeared on their front page. And you can actually go on the App Store and download it for free. Um, and if you do that, you get a lot of the basic functionality, like uh, file searching and app launching and stuff like that. Um, when I first started using it, I really just needed an app launcher. I wanted to be able to type one letter and have the computer just know which app I wanted. And I still use it for that, like, 50% of the time. But it does so much more than that, especially if you upgrade to the paid version. So basically, when you download Alfred, you get the, the free version, which comes with your file search and your um, your app launching and all that basic stuff. And then uh, if you pay for the power pack, which I think is like 30 bucks, but it's in, it's in euros, so it's a little different. Um, but if you pay for the power pack, then you get tons more stuff. And I'm actually going to open it up so I can make sure I mention what it is you can do in here. Um, so the Power Pack, most importantly, it unlocks workflows, which are kind of the custom functions of Alfred that anybody can make. Uh, and I've actually dabbled at making a few of those myself. But it also uh, opens up a bunch of other stuff. I can't really, actually, now that I have the Power Pack, I can't see which features are Power Pack only. Uh, but there's things in here like dealing with your contacts. Uh, it has its own iTunes player. Uh, it'll integrate with 1Password, which I love and am totally dependent on. It will do terminal commands for you. Uh, oh, and then most importantly, it'll do workflows, which means anybody can go in and write uh, actions for it to do, and it'll do them. So I've written things like uh, empty my downloads folder is probably my most well-known one, where uh, if I type empty, actually, the keyword I use here is empty DL, but I just type EMP, and it already knows what I want. Um, but that'll empty your downloads folder as if it were the trash can. So that works really well for me, because I don't tend to keep things in there, but things pile up, right? So once I'm kind of, if I think of it, I'll just, I'll do that, and it'll get rid of everything in there, clean it out. Um, but I wrote workflows just to very quickly open the websites that I uh, use a lot. I have a workflow in here that lets me tag files and folders, which is an, a nice feature built into OS X. Um, I've got, st actually, there's one in here that searches a Pokedex. So while I was playing Pokemon, if I was fighting something and I wanted to know, uh, <laughs> like, what, you know, what it was type weak against or strong against, I could do that. I could nice. just type dex and then the name of the Pokemon, and it would come up, and you don't have to press enter or anything. It just comes up and tells you, you know, this type is strong against this type. So it knows which Pokemon you want, what type it is, and then it'll tell you which types it's strong against and weak against. Um, there's a top processes one. Wow, this is complicated. <laughs> there's a top processes one that will come up with a list of all the things that are using your computer's resources. I mean, there's just unlimited numbers. There's, there's crazy amounts of these things. And anybody can make one in most of your common scripting languages. So if you're a programmer and you want to make your own uh, thing, like I do this all the time. If I need, if there's an action that I do a lot and I just want to be able to invoke it very quickly, I will make a workflow for it. Um, so the, the key with Alfred is that it's about, it's like the command line 
for your computer that no longer needs the command line. Like, back in the day on older computers, all you had was a text prompt, right? And you would type what you wanted, and it would happen. And we've gotten away from that, because now we have these metaphors, like windows and sliding, who's and what's it's and bars everywhere and stuff like that. And I love that stuff. I'm a total GUI guy. But sometimes you just want to type something and have it happen. And Alfred lets you do that with more things. Um, one of the things that's really cool about it is you can, if you're doing an action on multiple files, like let's say I want to grab a bunch of files and move them, you can uh, kind of, there's like a buffer in there, so you can select files one at a time and then type what you want to do, and it will do it to all of them. So you can oh, move great. a bunch of files to one location or tag a bunch of files or whatever it is you want to do, you can easily do that. So it's it's bringing back a little bit of what was good about the command line without all of what was difficult about the command line. Very fair. That's awesome. Yeah, I've, um, I've just downloaded the basic version for my laptop, which will actually kind of segue into our next segment about setup and work – or setup and um, – workflows, because I, when I moved out here to California, um, I got a laptop from work, which is awesome, because I got a free MacBook, basically, to work with. Nice. Um, yeah, it's very nice. Thank you, employer. Um, but Boy, I just same, left my employer, so now I'm down one laptop. Ah, uh, that's the worst. So, uh, your, your, my gloss is your game. That, there we go. Uh, but anyway, the, the issue is that I am not super great with the whole laptop setup of, like, the touchpad and that, and I'm, but the problem is I, like, work, I'll be sitting on the couch or I'll be, you know, sitting in bed and stuff working because I'm working from home, why not? So it's not really conducive to having a mouse all the time, so I'm really trying to get used to, like, limiting how much mouse using I'm doing and just being more strictly keyboard, and Alfred looks like it's going to be a huge help to that. Um, like I say, I haven't even gotten the workflow package yet, but um, being able to just type in, you know, oh, I want to open this file because, like, all my all my jobs are coded by numbers, um, and so I can just, I open Alfred, I type in, like, the first two numbers of it, and it's like, oh, do you want this brief? And I'm like, yes, that's the one. You know, I click, or I either click it, or I just hit um, command, whatever, and it's open for me. So it's saved me a ton of time already. Awesome. Yeah. You know, it's not that Spotlight can't do these things; it totally can. But the way that it's presented is just not what you need. Like with Alfred, it's like you type what you want, and boom, there it is. And with Spotlight, mm -hmm. it's like it's off in the corner, and it's all separated by file type, and like it's just not, it's not presenting you, you with what you need yeah. right now. And, and if you you're can not tell, exactly. you can tell they're in the new version they're exactly. dealing with that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, in the new version of Spotlight in uh, Yosemite, you can tell that they've recognized that that's an issue and they're they're working on it and, and really making it more Alfred-like. Oh, okay. Well, that's nice to hear. Yeah, it'll be great for people who are, you know, who like to use the built-in tools and, and aren't out there looking for productivity apps all the time like we are. That's fair. So anything else you wanted to add about your uh, adventures in trackpad land? Um, that was the big thing. Um, I still inevitably get caught in the thing where I have a finger down, I try to click, and it right clicks for me and doesn't do what uh, I want it to. But can, um, other than that... If you want to... I'm sure there's a way can stop that. Well, there are different ways that you can deal with right clicking. Um, a lot of my students would set it so that if you clicked in the corner of your mouse pad, it would right-click. And that drove me absolutely nuts because I am a two-finger clicker. That's kind mm -hmm. of how I prefer to do it. But, um, but also something that I like to do, that maybe it'll work for you, maybe it won't, but I like to, uh, to turn on tap to click. So you don't actually have to press the button to click. You just tap on the, um, on the trackpad, and it will initiate a click. Okay. So, you, so it's less physical thing you have to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I really like it. In fact, I would not be that surprised if they eventually remove the, the button clickery of it entirely and just make it a surface mm -hmm. that you tap on. Um, yeah. But it, it feels a little bit more kind of iPhone, iPad-like, I guess, that way. Cool. Um, but, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll say this about trackpads. When I had my MacBook Pro... I got pretty good with the trackpad. Like, I could get around pretty quick, and mm -hmm. I never really had any problem navigating. 
But I have the Magic Trackpad for my iMac here. Oh, yeah? I cannot use it. I don't know why. Like, I also have a mouse. Mm-hmm. And I love, oh, man, I love this mouse. Like, I cannot be happier with it. It's the best mouse in the world. But I have the trackpad, too, for scrolling and for when I want to scroll horizontally. And mm-hmm. sometimes if the mouse isn't connected, I'll go to use the trackpad. And I can't use it. I don't know why. I mean, maybe it's just because the screen is so massive. I have a 27-inch iMac, and it's just way mm-hmm. too hard to get the, the cursor across yeah. the screen, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I wonder, too, if it might be because it's at an angle. Yeah, like, that really bothers me. In fact, I tried putting it up on stuff. Like, I would, uh, uh-huh. you know, it, it's at this kind of an angle. So I would yeah. put, sorry, audio listeners. So I would put, like, something under it to make it flat. But even then, it was better. It is better. But I just still can't do it. It's like, I'll go, I'll move all the way across the screen to hit a small target, like the the red X uh, circle to close a window, or the green circle to change its size. And I'll get really, really close, but I don't have the fine precision to get right on it and click it. Whereas with the mouse... I can move all the way across the screen and click a tiny target and move all the way back without even thinking about it. Yep. And so it's really hard for me to commit to using the trackpad more. But uh, if anybody out there has trackpad tips or uh, trackpad training routines or anything like that, send them my way. Yeah, let us know. Uh, so you were going to... Oh, okay, so speaking of uh, workflow stuff, I'll talk about my workflow thing. Sure. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about Inbox Zero which I'm sure many people have, uh, you know, some amount of consternation about, um, and specifically the way I operate with Inbox Zero. So the concept of Inbox Zero is that every item in your email inbox constitutes something you must do, right? So somebody sends you an email, and they're either telling you something or they're asking for something. If they're telling you something, you have to read the email so you know what they're telling you. And if they're asking for something of you, then you need to define what that thing is, and you need to do it. But one of the problems that we have is that we just kind of let the emails pile up. And I'm not talking about unread emails. I'm talking about, like, stuff you've already looked at that just kind of sits in there. And, um... Oh, sorry. So stuff that just sits in there. And nobody really likes to have thousands of emails piled up in their inbox. In fact, at my worst, I had, you know, about a thousand emails piled up. Mm -hmm. And, uh... And it's just, it's too stressful. I don't want to deal with that. Like, I don't want to have to parse the whole email inbox just to figure out what I need. Um, so I sat down a while back, and I kind of tried to get a handle on how I could do things differently. And the real revelation came when an app called Mailbox came out for iOS. And I waited for a really long time to actually get into this thing. It's got kind of a, it had like a limited uh, entry system where basically like you would say that you wanted to use it and then you would wait a really long time in line while everybody else got access and then eventually they would let you in. And um, and so when I finally did get access to it, I, I realized that it really is the way that I like to operate. Uh, and I, I don't know if I can show it right now, but I'm going to pop it up so you can see it. So uh, now nah, you can't see that. I'll put up the website. So... Um, it, it basically, you know, it looks at the start like your average, uh, here we go, your average email client. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, a list of emails, and then you can, uh, you know, tap an email to view it. But what's really cool about Mailbox is that it's got these gestures that let you very easily archive emails, and it kind of plays into the way that Gmail is designed to work. So Gmail, what's interesting about Gmail is Google designed it so that you would never actually have to delete anything. They put in this archive function so that you could just archive the email that you weren't going to look at, like instead of deleting it, and that way it's gone from your site and you never have to think about it unless you want to see it, and then you can still search for it and it's there. Um, So Mailbox kind of plays into that by saying, well, if archived mail is still available in case you want to see it, why not just archive all the stuff that you're not, you know, you don't need to do right now uh, and then you're left with only the things you actually need to do, and you can treat email a little bit like a to-do list. So if you archive the stuff that's done, uh, and you are left with all the stuff that you need to do, then you have a list of tasks. And the other thing they did that's really interesting is they put in delay systems. So basically you can say, okay, I see that this email is a task, but I don't want to do this task right now, 
So send this back to me in a day or in a week or in an hour and a half. And you can very, very quickly tell it when to send that email back, and it'll just hold on to it and send it back to you when you're ready for it. So it's really, really nice because you don't have to... Um, you don't have to look at all that stuff that's just waiting to get done. If it's something you're not going to do until later, you send it away, and it'll come back later. So that's where it's really valuable. Uh, and so I've been able to kind of adopt that methodology not just on iOS, but now in Gmail, and soon they're actually going to release a Mac app. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, access all my delayed stuff on the computer as well. I'm really, really excited for that. Um, now, have you? What are, what's your email methodology. How do you handle email? Um, I did use Mailbox for a while. I am currently just um, Gmail on both uh, desktop and um, on my iPhone. I was actually, when I was in the office, I was actually able to keep to Inbox Zero just using vanilla Gmail because um, I, was able, I was basically you know on the computer all day, so I was able to keep up with it. Um, it's gotten a little bit away from me now, um, so I'd love to get back to that. It, hearing that there's going to be a mailbox for Mac is a very good option for that because that's what got me initially to Mailbox Zero. Um, but yeah, right now, in it, I think Mailbox Zero taught me the value of archiving because I never yeah, used to archive a wire. And then once I got that, I was like, oh, this is a brilliant thing to do, so I'll do this all the time. Yeah, I... Uh... Oh, Weird. I'm trying to uh, take a look at the beta of uh, Mailbox app for Mac, but uh, it's not working out. Um, yeah, I, I'm a little bit in kind of a similar boat where, like, I didn't at first understand the value in archiving, and mm -hmm. now I feel like I have a much better understanding of, like, why they designed it that way. And it makes yeah. so much sense now, but before it was like, what does this button do? Why do I need this? I can just throw things yeah, out. Exactly. Why would I want to archive things if they could just be in my inbox and be fine? Right. Yeah, I had, like, thousands of emails in my inbox, and I, it took me forever to, to archive them because you can only do, like, 100 at a time. But, yeah. uh, but once I had done that, I realized, like, oh, if I want to see everything, I just click all mail, and yep. then I see all my mail. <laughs> it's like there's no need to keep it in your inbox because yeah. it's not gone if it's not in your inbox. Yep. Like people people treat their inbox like it's their whole, that's the whole system. And once it's gone from there, you can never see it again. And that's not the way Gmail is supposed to work. Exactly. So uh, so that's huge for me, i got to say. That's like a, a big, big deal. In fact, uh, it's, the other thing that's nice about kind of that boomeranging system where things keep coming back is if I send something away, like, come back in an hour, come back in an hour, come back in an hour, by the end of the day, it's like, oh, my God, this is so annoying. I just need to do this thing so I can stop. Kind of come back every hour, and then I do it. So it must be working. Yeah. In fact, so when I have when something I... that's been coming back to me every day for a few days now, and I need to do it. <laughs> well, um, get on. Yeah, I do. I will. Uh, I'll have to do that. I actually meant to do it today, and I didn't. I'm such a bad person. I'm gonna do it tomorrow. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, let's jump on to our discussion section, which maybe we should make a little bit shorter than we had in mind before, because it's already getting kind of long. Sure thing, yeah. Uh, so do you want to jump in and, and introduce yeah. this topic? Uh, so our topic is going to be uh, massive online, massive open online courses, not to be confused with massively multiplayer online RPGs, um, although I think the name stole one from the other. Um, yeah. Basically, um, what started off, you know, close to 100 years ago now as correspondence courses over the mail and radio broadcast courses from NYU has since evolved into online courses that are available for free to anyone through schools like Harvard, MIT, NYU, Stanford, UCLA. Basically, you know, any almost every major school now has at least one MOC available um, or MOOC available through, um, and one of the most popular sites is edx.org, where um, you can take any, pretty much, you know, if you if there's a topic, you can probably find a course on it. Some will be better than others. Some are more conducive than others. But um, it's great to have that kind of an option. Um, I first actually learned about MOOCs um, about a year ago looking, looking for um, game design courses, just curious about what was out there. Um, 
terms of you know, college level classes, whether about game theory or probability and stuff like that. And I saw that there was one through EDX um, about the study of probability, which I thought that'd be cool. I'll take that. Signed up for it in like November. The course didn't start until February. On New Year's Eve, I got an email saying, hey, from edx.org, saying, hey, start the new year right with a new class. And one of the classes they had was Harvard CS50, which is basically their computer science 101 class. They call it 50 because they're Harvard and they like to be special. Um, Who doesn't like to but, be special? So I, and it started January 1st. So I was like, sure, I'll sign up for that and see what it's about. I've yet to take the probability course because I'm still in the CS50 course and I'm absolutely loving it. It's probably one of EDX's flagship courses because it's just really been built for that platform. They've got you know lectures, they've got problem sets, they've got the um, this, what they call sections, which are basically like additional lectures run by the TAs. They've got all these shorts that you can watch about it, any specific topic, and they give you um, a um, controlled environment through VMware Fusion, they give you a year license to it for free. And Which basically, is awesome you're, time. yeah, exactly. And so you're basically in a Unix environment, doing the command line stuff, writing in C, doing everything, and able to send all the stuff to their program checker, and it will tell you if you did it right or not in real time. It's, it, and it's phenomenal. And I mean, this is obviously like the best case and a quarter case scenario for, ED, for a MOOC where, you know, everything is working perfectly. But um, I think it's really, it shows the promise that these, that, that MOOCs have too. Yeah, I, I got to say, after talking to you about this, I signed up for it too. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am really liking it so far. I haven't had as much time as I'd like to, to, to devote to it, but I'm going to do more in the near future. Uh, and you, I think you're right that it's their flagship course. It's like it's the only one I ever see, you know, kind of pushed on their front page and everything. Yeah. Um, they definitely are, are really putting a lot of uh, effort behind it, and you can totally tell. I mean, it really shows that they've put a lot of work into this. Uh, and I, you know, I no learned a lot about MOOCs doing my master's in education, and I've uh, this is like a big new direction that the industry is going, mm -hmm. and. It's really exciting, and this is like a perfect example of where it can be. Uh, and if there were more courses out there like this, I think that's good for the world. Yeah. You know, I think that's a really great thing. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting deeper in and playing around a little bit more. I also got to say, I love that there are certification options, but you can also get the course for free. And that's yeah. really, really huge, especially since if you want to get certified, why not look at the course first, just get a sense for it, and then if it's really something you want to do, then you commit. Uh, there's actually been a little bit of controversy in the world of MOOCs because they don't have high retention rates. You know, generally, tons and tons of people sign up. Not all that many people finish. But the more forward-thinking among us recognize that that's not a problem. That's actually a good thing because it means lots of people are trying. They're willing to go out and try. But then the ones that find the thing that fits them they're following through. And the the idea that... <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not employed at a school anymore because they uh, <laughs> might not like it if I said this, but uh, the idea that you can get perfect 100% follow-through on something, I think is outdated. Like, oh, yeah. you, you, you know, I understand the need to throw 20 or 30 kids into an algebra classroom and make sure that every kid learns algebra. That is very important. But <laughs> with something like this that's... Uh, a lot, it's a, a skill that's more specialized. Isn't it better if the people who are interested in it are the ones who, you know, they put in the time, they put in the dedication, and they're able to learn it? What's going on with my video? Here? Yeah, it's, um, it's something of a long-tail oh, approach to education, which I think is great. Um, for those who don't know, long-tail is basically this idea that if you've got stuff, particularly in a digital sphere where... You, there's no, there's virtually no cost to storing it. Like this was very popular once MP3s kind of overtook CDs, or um, like print-on-demand books, where you know it doesn't cost you anything to store it, so you can have all of these opportunities available to people. And if only one percent of one percent actually follow through, it's of no loss to you. You're, but you're getting those people through that are actually going to do it and are going to do well. So right. that's of a benefit to you. And some of those people might not have been able to access that course in another way. 
I mean, in this case, exactly. you've got a course from Harvard where most people are not able to go. I didn't go to Harvard, yeah. you know, and yet I can go take this class, and I may be successful at it. And even though lots of people won't be successful at it, it's a way for, you know, even if I could get into Harvard, I might not be able to afford it, you know, and I could still go and take this course, and I could get a Harvard education. And that's the thing is the... Um, it kind of changes the value proposition. So that knowledge that exists within Harvard is no longer locked in that expensive box that only the privileged may enter. It's now mm -hmm. freely available, and now that box has different value. Now its value is in the connections you make and the access to professors and the environment that you're in and the structured programs that they offer, right? Like, there's still tons of value there, potentially even enough value for the exorbitant amount of money that you're paying <laughs> to go there. But uh, mm -hmm. but the knowledge is no longer hidden. The knowledge is open and available to everybody, and I think that's really valuable. Actually, it'll be interesting to see if this access to the information does change that price tag at all over time. I don't think it's going to be anything that happens for a decade or so, but you know, it might have that effect of being like, hey, you know, we're we're what we're offering now is of a different value than it was ten years ago. Do we have to kind of refigure that out? Yeah, the the whole value proposition behind higher education is a multifaceted and fascinating issue that is I think is definitely going to see some change. I don't know what kind of change we'll see, but there's a lot of attention around it for a variety of reasons, including this one. So we'll see what happens with that in the next few years. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, just really quickly before we move on, I think we should uh, you know just kind of finish up pretty soon because we're running a little bit long already. No, yeah, but, that's uh, fine. But just really, really quickly, you put in a section in here for CS50 alternatives. Yes. And uh, we should both talk about that a little bit, I think. Mm -hmm. um, some are paid, some are free. All are excellent. Uh, yeah. The one I want to highlight here specifically is Codecademy.com, mm -hmm. which has been huge for me personally. Uh, I used it to learn JavaScript, which opened a lot of doors for me. It helped me learn Unity, which is a game development environment that I taught at work for several years. Uh, it's helped me learn PHP. It's helped me learn Python. Uh, there's all these different programming languages on there that you can learn, and uh, APIs and all this other stuff. I won't get into programming terminology here, but there's all kinds of stuff you can learn on Code Academy, and it's all free, and it's fun, and there's forums there where you can talk to other people who are working on stuff, and God, it's just the best. I love it. Yeah. Um, so if you have any interest in learning how to program, which, you know, we'll spend some time on a future episode just talking about the value of programming and computer science thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's valuable for anything that you want to do. Uh, but I've done so much stuff on there, and it's just the best. I I'm, may even go back there this week and do some more because I want to, you know, brush up on some stuff that I uh, haven't done in a while, and it's just awesome. Mm -hmm. Which of these do you yeah, like? No. Um, I like Codecademy. It, there, there was a little bit... One thing that kind of let me down just a little bit in it was that, like, it taught me, like, the language of it, but it didn't teach me, like, the... Like, I, when I finished Code Academy, I went to write a JavaScript page, and then it didn't work, and I was like, why isn't this working? And it's like, oh, you need this header there before it's going to work. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. So there's, like, a little bit of that that I feel like was missing. Yeah, um, there's, it's you... definitely not in context. Like, you, you, the stuff that you write on Code Academy works in Code Academy. Exactly. You know? Um, uh, the issue that I always had with that was the students would try to, like, the first thing I would have them do in Unity is print a line of text. And yep. so they would type in console.log because in Code Academy you're working in a browser, so you use console.log to print. Mm -hmm. And they're not in a browser, so they go and type console.log and they get an error, and they're like, oh, it's and why isn't it working? And it's because, well, the print command is different in a different environment. And yeah. it's little things like that, and they just had no, there was nothing to show them that things might be different in a different environment. Like, they were, they were kind of led to believe that Codecademy is the way all things are, and it's yeah. not. Well, I think, I think one thing, too, I've learned just in general in learning computer science stuff is that it's all about documentation. Mm -hmm. And whatever you're going to be doing, you need to be willing to sit down and read up on the documentation whenever you have a question, because that's how you're going to figure stuff out like that, versus just having it handed to you through a tutorial, because there's just so many pardon the computer science term, but there's so many variables involved that they can't give you one tutorial that's going to cover all that. Um, yeah, the, the best documentation, I got to say, has a variety of examples in addition to 
explanation and talking about all the, the commands and everything, it, it's got to have multiple pathways through which you can see how the thing works. Mm-hmm. Another one that is that seems really good is Treehouse, but they are a paid or, or a subscription service. I've um, done uh, their like free trial once or twice, and it is yeah. very very good. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say it's you know light years better than Codecademy. It's it's it there's more video, there's more uh, you know time put into the creation of the instruction, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't say that it's worth uh, well. It's it's worth it if it's the way you like to learn. Like it's great because it's got quizzes built in and it's got video and it's like it's much more of a it's closer to the experience of a class while still being interactive. Whereas Code Academy is more like a a series of exercises that's kind of a conversation between you and the service where you're yeah. just completing the tasks yeah, that it assigns you. Yeah, I think that's the difference that came to mind to me is it seemed that Treehouse was more project based where Code Academy yeah. was more based, which I think I saw value in that. Um, But again, it's subscription-based and pretty fairly expensive for a subscription. It is pretty expensive. It's really a shame how expensive it is, actually, because I I do like it, but it just doesn't... I don't know. It it doesn't provide enough additional value. You know, there's some stuff in it that's really, really great, but I mean, Mm -hmm. if I can live with a lower production value video, I can go on YouTube and I can watch a video about loops or about, uh, you know... um, color theory or something like that. They do a great job with their videos, but it's that whole idea of locking knowledge or information behind a paywall, right? Information is free. Knowledge is free. And it's going to get out there, so you have to offer something other than just the knowledge itself. And they do a good job of offering presentation, but I don't know if it's a good enough job for me to pay what they're asking especially for the topics that they're talking about, because a lot of the topics that they're doing are stuff that is easily found elsewhere. Whereas another one that you listed here, lynda.com, mm-hmm. one of their strengths is that they have a very wide variety of topics and yeah. excellent instructors, not quite the level of production value of Treehouse, but a wider mm-hmm. variety so that you can get the specific thing that you want. I use that to learn uh, uh, Objective-C and Xcode, and oh. that was a great course. Oh, my God, it was awesome. I still find Objective-C to be a total mess, and I, I, for me anyway, I think it's very difficult. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm excited for Swift, which is Apple's new programming language that's going to replace it. But, uh, but the teacher was fantastic. The, the course was great. And I should also mention one of my uh, college professors who is, like, my favorite teacher ever, he does some courses on Linda, which is pretty cool. Nice. So I've messed around with those a little bit. Although... Also, like, he does these amazing courses on, like, audio effects, but mm-hmm. there's a channel on Wikipedia, or Wikipedia, on uh, YouTube called Wikimedia that I used in my uh, audio production classes that I teach, and he's fantastic, like, just as good as anything you would see on <laughs> Linda.com. In fact, usually better, because he has all these awesome animations, and, like, he just puts a lot of work into his YouTube channel, and it's just as good as something you'd pay for. Yeah. Uh, and that's the way things are going. Like, people are recognizing that yeah, you might put a lot of work into something, but someone else out there is willing to do it for free because they enjoy it. You know? And I think the balance there is that with YouTube, for example, well, with Linda, you know you know what you're getting. Yeah. Like, you're, you're 99% sure you know what you're getting. You might get one crappy class, but generally you know what you're... Whereas YouTube, you might have to search for a while through different... Like, I remember you when I was looking into Blender, you showed me that series of tutorials on that, which were great. Yeah. But I know I... there's also dozens of others that are either really dry, really slow, or don't tell you what you need to know. I looked through them all before I found the one that I sent you. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the thing. You, you have to be willing to uh, to kind of wade through the crap, but yep. uh, you can... You can it, YouTube benefits from the power of social recommendations, which, you know, Linda doesn't quite as much. Like, uh, so here's an example that's a little bit off topic. So this morning, I went to the gym, and before I went to the gym, I was reading Reddit's fitness section, because I wanted to, you know, I whenever I have a question about whether I'm doing something right, I just search it on Reddit fitness, and somebody's talking about it. So I found a discussion about a uh, form for barbell squats, and there was this link to a half-hour-long YouTube video that is the best explanation of how to squat. And you wouldn't think it would take half an hour to explain how to squat, but it really does. It's very... Surprisingly complex. 
Uh, but it was amazing. This guy, like, he was just fantastic. Just did a great job explaining it. He demonstrated it a ton of times, and he, like, was showing, like, how you need to get your hip below your knee level. So he put, like, you know, pink tape on his knee and then on his hip so that you could see, like, when his hip got below knee level. It's just the coolest thing. People huh. do these things... And it's like it was low production value, but it was a great explanation of the topic. And yeah, like well, that guy could go do something with higher production value, and he could charge for it. Mm -hmm. But people are perfectly willing to watch that lower one. It's actually um, I do a podcast plug here. So I watch uh, a podcast called Cord Killers. That's all about uh, cord cutting, like cutting cable, uh, mm -hmm. and getting your TV over the internet. But um, Brian Brushwood, one of the hosts of that show, always talks about the diff the uh, the distinction between convenience and fidelity. So people will choose convenience over fidelity most of the time, uh, which is why you get your crappy quality audio MP3s, your crappy quality video over streaming services. Because it's so convenient, people are willing to take the dip in quality. So you don't see people going out and buying Blu-rays or Super Audio CDs or whatever the hell the audio thing is now. Like, I'm a total audiophile, and I still use streaming music services because it's so much more convenient and a lot cheaper. Um, and and I you know I recognize the value in an extremely high quality audio recording. I I love listening to that stuff, but I'm not going to go out and pay tons of money for it. Yeah. So that I kind of think brings us to the the conclusion here. Yeah, that was um, all I had to say about MOOCs. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is really fun. Oh, absolutely. I think Let's I think begin. hopefully everyone else has enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, we had a couple of viewers, so that's cool. Oh, cool. <laughs> I don't know anymore. They're gone. But hopefully yeah. we'll see some people uh, on YouTube as a, an archive. Uh, uh -huh. And in the future, like next week, I may try to do this from my channel that has all my videos on it, not my personal channel. Uh, and that way we can get kind of a built-in base of people. Uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and sign off, and then we can, we can discuss further. Absolutely. Um, so... Thanks for watching. This has been the uh, Get It Made show. I believe I said that right. Get It Made. Uh, and uh, we'll be back next week at a, around the same time, maybe a few hours earlier. Uh, I think it's going to be 3 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, right, on Mondays? That's the uh, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. 6 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. What, what he said. My time doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so um, so in the meantime, if you're looking for us, uh, you can find me at twitter.com slash rocketude, uh, okay. and I will have some other um, links to things that I do, like my GitHub profile and my website, my YouTube channel, in the show notes, which I guess we'll put on YouTube, but maybe in the future we want to do like a, a site, like a blog. Sure. Yeah, um, you can find me at twitter.com slash boardgameben. Um, should be down in my lower third that I now have. Hooray. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I also have a blog, boardgameben.com, which will hopefully be up in the next day or two. Awesome. Uh, and check us out next week for graphics and music and bumpers and all the other things that you expect from a show. Professional uh, quality. Yeah, and then hopefully in the future we'll get a podcast feed going. I still have to figure out how I'm going to handle that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is coming. So stay tuned. We'll see you next week. See you next week. <laughs>